I've been finding this inherent divinity within creation. And like the more I study ecology and soil and this intricately woven web of relations, that a lot of these, um, these teachings that we read in scriptures are patterned in the natural world and in creation. And so it's just, it's fascinating that At what point did you begin taking gardening and farming more seriously, not just as like a, a thing to pay the bills that you weren't morally opposed to, but actually something that you were very passionate about? Yeah, um, I'd say it's probably at least a few years ago. Um, so the job that I came back to with urban farming, I was, I lived down the road. I didn't have a, a car, so I just ride my bike everywhere. Didn't even have my license, and so even if I wanted to, I couldn't. And the job didn't pay me enough to actually buy a car, so I was okay being in a place that I I couldn't drive. Um, but I would work with a summer youth program, and so I'd teach kids about farming and gardening, and introduce them into that, which was um, really cool. But at the same time, I was our we did a lot of weeding and there's just like the introduction to gardening wasn't the most pleasant introduction. And so I was like, no, I think not, man. <laughs> and, and there's just like a lot of wrapped around it too, because the, the kids that I would work with were predominantly African American. And so there's a lot of like ancestral traumas of slavery. And then um, having the introduction into farming and agriculture that all humanity has some form of ancestral lineage with having that reintroduction being sitting on a bucket in the heat of the afternoon, pulling grass out of the ground by your hand. It's just like, I was questioning um, if farming was something that I really was to be doing. Cause I, I thought my time was more valuable than just spending my life weeding and that mm -hmm. I didn't feel comfortable introducing kids to what I found to be something really magical. I didn't, that introduction just wasn't magical. <laughs> and so I was, um, and I wasn't making a lot of money at the time. And so I just questioned, I was like, well, I don't, I don't know if farming is really what I need to be doing or if this is what I'm called to do. And so at this point I was like almost at the point of trying to be a monk, thinking I might become a monk, and at that point I um, started dating my partner, who we're still together, Kelly, and went through a lot of interesting experiences of what it's like trying to be in a relationship with someone that's not sure if they're supposed to be in human relationships like that. And luckily she was full of grace of the whole process and allowed me to... Um, come to the realization that that path wasn't for me. And so it's like slowly this place of like trying to get grounded where after the bicycle journey, I was in a really far out place spiritually of just like this wanting to be disconnected from the material world and then trying mm -hmm. to come to this place where I'm more grounded with the material world and like farming definitely was helping with that. And so I wanted to be able to take it more seriously, but I wasn't sure if, the current manifestation was what my calling was was to be. And so we ended up going to India with my partner's teacher and were able to go on pilgrimage there. Went to the birth, birthplace of Sri Ramakrishna and a lot of different holy sites related to his life and uh, um, lineage there and got to visit a lot of other holy places and was just trying to be in this moment, this place of prayer of trying to figure out what I was supposed to do with my life. <laughs> and I um, was blessed with a dream where I usually don't take dreams seriously, don't feel like I ever get insight from them, even if I wanted to take them seriously. But being in this place of trying to be in this mode of prayer, we were staying in the birthplace of Sri Ramakrishna. And I had a dream where a man in an orange robe came up to me and traditionally, the monks or the swamis in India, they wear an ochre or orange robe, and that's kind of like a sign of their renunciation. And so someone came up to me, and they looked at me, and they said, it's better to teach. 
and that was it. Mm. I, was, I didn't know who it was, but I was having these feelings where this draw to agriculture, I wasn't content with just growing food for people, but I was longing for something more. And ever since that experience, it's like kind of gave me more to, more motivation to do what I'm doing, but to also do it in a way that I'm able to share with others and not just be um, doing it for myself. Because even like on our bicycle mm. journey together, I would go through times of struggling of if I wanted to share pictures on social media because it was like a very intimate personal journey that I was on. And I wasn't trying to inflate my ego by saying, hey, look at this cool place that we're at. Mm. Yeah. So what's the internal process that I'm going through right now? And so that pilgrimage really, I feel like, helped ground me down a little bit more to come back to Ohio um, and find another farm job and actually be like, okay, what does it mean to actually take this seriously and see it as also a spiritual path where it's not just a secular job, but this is my way of being of service to God. Mm -hmm. um, and so kind of at that point, I feel like is when it started to, to rechristen a little bit in a material way. Yeah. It's amazing what happens when we take things seriously. <laughs> We're all in, right, you know, right. what you're describing with the volunteers that you're working with reminds me of this book called the color of food stories of race, resilience and farming by Natasha Bowens. You familiar with that one? I don't think I am. So Natasha Bowens, she got really into farming as well. And she has a similar background to the volunteers you described where um, her her heritage is that she has family members that were part of what was it? The 40 acres and a mule promise that didn't mm -hmm. actually materialize for a whole lot of people. And uh, it just is an interesting background into that whole world. As far as like when we say, yay, let's, let's go garden and help with the community plot or whatever, that there might be some residual uh, wounds because yeah. agriculture is so tied to a, a, really a history of horror or oppression mm -hmm. for a lot of people. Yeah. So it's like, and then she's trying to redeem that and saying, no, like we need to be able to, you know, take the power back and, and do it in growing beets and <laughs> kale, right, right. you yeah. know, it's like, you know, we can't let this wound uh, hold us back from producing our own local food and, and nourishment and a source of life. So she has an important, Important work and her, again her name is Natasha Bowens so I uh, I'm wondering if you could describe like what you're doing now I think we're we're almost to the point in your timeline where we're to present day right yeah we're yes we are so I am um, I'm still farming and I'm actually kind of back at the the first job that I had but in um, kind of a different context in I'm managing the farm, and we're in the process of starting a new farm in Talmadge. So the, the urban farm is in Akron, and we're going to start a new farm in Talmadge, which is where I'm from. So it's kind of like this. this That's a big full, full circle. circle of, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm um, feeling really good about it because I've do, been doing a lot of internal work and, and um, introspection and contemplation just of, the journey leaving Talmadge and just that whole process growing up and needing to seek things in the, in the world. And then like this process of coming back and seeking wholeness, like this journey of seeking wholeness and doing it in ways that weren't aligning with me as a whole through um, who I am and like my timeline on this earth. So it's I feel like it's a lot of, it's like a confluence of a lot of, my past coming together that can be overwhelming at times, but feels really good and healing at the same time. Um, right. Yeah. So in, in what you're doing now, maybe you could describe like some of the movements that you're a part of or the, the types of farming. Uh, Cause when people say agriculture or farming, there's a whole lot of different pictures that can come up in people's mind. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So my um, draw to agriculture is more through, through what's going, that's, recently been um, called regenerative agriculture or there's a lot of different words that describe kind of a, a similar thing but regenerative agriculture or agroecology 
Um, permaculture is connected with it all, but in essence, it's it's trying to um, acknowledge that humans are part of this greater ecosystem of life, and that it's really easy to have this divorce between humans and nature, especially living in a city where um, the way we've structured things are in order to try to dominate nature and separate ourselves from nature. But um, kind of the foundation of regenerative agriculture and agroecology is acknowledging humans, the human place within that ecosystem and um, being a steward of the ecosystem and understanding that nature functions and patterns and holes and if we just do what we as humans want to do, there's a good chance that doesn't align with how nature functions. And we create a lot of unintended consequences and a lot of problems. And um, we can see that with modern day agriculture with just monocrop fields, the increased use of, of synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, insecticides, and each year you have to use a little bit more and um, go down a rabbit hole with that. But the reverse of that is acknowledging our presence in the greater ecosystem and that it can be beneficial if we understand these patterns and these principles of nature and use them to contextualize our practices. And so um, like what that practically can look like and looks like for us is to forego tillage, which is um, a pretty common practice. Even with gardening, you think of spring, the first thing that you do is you you bust out the tiller and you till up the soil and um, understanding how ecosystems function and that there are disturbances that happen in nature, but it's not a perpetual process where if it keeps happening, then it keeps reverting the ecosystem to an earlier succession. So there's this idea of ecosystem succession where you start out with bare ground, plants start to come, kind of have grassland happening in a meadow shrubs and trees start to come in, you've got a forest, then you've got the old growth forest. And it's this process that's happening that kind of looks linear, but it's not that linear. But it's this process over time and space. And when disturbance comes in, it reverts one succession back to another. And then time happens and it's nature's trying to progress back to that place. And so when we see tillage as a disturbance practice that reverts an ecosystem back to an earlier succession. And when we understand what we're trying to grow, doesn't grow in those earlier successions that we're, we keep recreating, then um, we find ways to not use that practice. So okay. I don't know if that makes sense. Yeah. So what does it look like uh, maybe practically? Yeah. Um, so for what we do, we take, um, a composted leaf mulch and and some like we will you will sometimes use tillage to open up a space like if you have grass and so using it as a um, I'd say more of a technique to start something off but not a management technique so you've got the your bare soil and your plants growing in it and then you keep the soil mulched because if the soil is bare in nature nature doesn't like to have bare soil and will always have plants growing on it or some form of mulch on it. And so we put mulch on our soil so that's never bare and we plant directly into that mulch and we use cover crops. And so when cover crops die, then we can plant directly into them. Um, and if we keep up on the weeding, we never have this problem that we need to go through with the tiller to to, um, to weed them because a lot of people use tillage as a means to get rid of weeds and to prepare a seed bed. So if we can do that without needing tillage, then we don't have to use that, that practice. So no um, tractors then? So we don't have a tractor. Um, they definitely can have their place, but not, they don't need to be used as tillage. So actually with the new farm, we're thinking about getting one to have a bucket loader to put um, compost and wood chips into wheelbarrows for us so that we can move those. Because um, I recently just injured my back and was out of, out of condition uh, for like two weeks. All that and, shovel work, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
and that and just like my bike journey I, I hurt my knees pretty badly and they're getting a lot better but I've been trying getting older trying to think about the sustainability of what I'm doing not just from the earth standpoint but from the human Your standpoint of, yeah <laughs> <laughs> so if we can be strategic and use appropriate uh -huh. technology to mitigate the damage to us as humans and the earth then I, I feel pretty good about that Right. That's the thing about sustainability. It's like, you gotta, you gotta sustain this too, right? right? <laughs> it's gotta be holistic. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. So I just wonder, uh, well, first of all, what's the name of your farm? So it is called living city farms. Um, all right. We just came out with that name. So I'm pretty happy before we've just been a, an urban farm connected with this restaurant called Miss Julie's kitchen. Mm -hmm. So now we're, becoming I like our, the name. I like the name. It's pretty cool. It says a lot. Yeah. As in like you think of city as this like, you know, gray and black as in like concrete and asphalt and, you know, the occasional like shade tree, maybe that's mm -hmm. more like decorative than anything else. And, but then if you have a living city, it, it connotes that there's going to be production. There's going to be sustenance. There's going to be nutrition. Yeah. Yeah. Am I reading that right? Yeah, no, that's definitely an aspect. The name actually came when we, um, we're cleaning up the spaces outside of the gardens. There's a lot of trash because we're in the middle of the city and there's this hawk that came and just like was gracing us for a couple of days and just came and hung out with us. And there's just like this deep sense of feeling of um, appreciation of caring for the earth, but also that humans aren't the only ones here that are inhabiting the space that we're co-inhabitants with birds with insects with microbes with other humans with plants with trees and just this this whole abundance of of life of creation and that for me that interconnectivity is kind of like the underpinning of everything that i do or try to do and so having a living city is and seeing it through that lens for me is just like very fulfilling yes yes yeah. So one of the other listeners to this program, uh, I mentioned that I was going to be having an interview with a, a farmer and he sent me a link to, to Joel Salatin. And I'm just wondering if you're familiar with him or have crossed paths with him at all. Yeah. Um, I am, I haven't read any of his books, but the first farm that I worked at, they, um, were partly inspired to farm through his farm model and his style of chicken tractor and so they made like a chicken the tractor exact, the, yeah they made this little it's tractor more so this chicken coop that can move it's on wheels and so you move it around every day so that the chickens they graze and they don't overgraze the grass and the pasture and they they poop and they eat the insects and they're fertilizing then they move and so it's this way of building soil and so they're really inspired by him um, he was a keynote speaker at a conference I was at a couple of years ago um, and had, a, a, I feel like, a pretty similar understanding of just being a, um, a steward of the earth mm. and wanting to um, do good instead of less harm or potentially yeah. bad. Yeah, so I was listening to one of his talks uh, just a couple of days before our conversation here. And I just found it so interesting that so much of his work is just interwoven with his spirituality. You know, he comes from the Christian background. And so just the, the creation story in Genesis, and there's a theory that says that there's, you know, one creation story, but then there's some that say that chapter one and then chapters two and three are actually two creation stories that were mm. put back to back. And there's a number of reasons to, to say that. But anyway, the first one says that uh, the typical one that a lot of people cling to is that, you know, humans are to have dominion over the earth. And of course that can be taken all different ways. And, and we've seen it in positive forms where it's like, no, we need to take resp responsibility as being mediators of heaven and earth. Right. Mm. But then also there's the negative sense where it's like you mentioned, like, no, we need to dominate the earth and we need to have dominion over it. And it's like a power struggle. Right. But then in the second creation story, that there's this element of stewardship that humans, it's like, no, actually I'm counting on you to garden the earth. Like, you know, it's like the garden in the creation uh, cosmology is actually like a micro or 
yeah, microcosm of how the macrocosm or how the earth and the balance of, of humans roles in it is to, to unfold. Mm. And so I, I just wonder like in, in, as you're becoming more, as you're becoming more involved in, and, and taking place in conferences and farms and, and really taking on this craft or this, uh, this calling, what was your spiritual practice like during this time? Um, that is a good question. <laughs> it's, yeah. Um, so I used to do a lot of meditation through the practice that I was taught through um, the lineage with Sri Ramakrishna. Um, and through this kind of journey into trying to seek that wholeness within myself, I was noticing that I was putting up this this block towards 18 years of my life growing up um, as a Lutheran in Christianity. And even like inherent to the teachings of a lot of different schools of thought within Hinduism, they are accepting of lots of different pathways and view Christianity as a valid pathway to God. But even within all that, I was still putting up this block. Yeah, let me let me just interject one thing, Steve. It was just yeah. interesting for me while we were traveling and I was, you know, learning what you were learning too. It was like, okay, so there would be a picture of like, call it like the, the, the top of the guru pyramid, if you want to say it. And like the, the most uh, well-respected gurus or teachers. And part of that was like, okay, there's Buddha, there's Sri Ramakrishna. And part of that lineup was Christ. And I was like, what's Christ doing there? And then I don't know if you can maybe explain that as far as what that dynamic is like. Um, yeah, I guess so. The I guess more of the, the worldview of a lot of Eastern philosophies and um, very like Hinduism is kind of hard to put all into one category because um, it's this a bunch of different philosophies that don't necessarily always agree with each other. Um, but the ones that I had contact with, the, the view is more so of creation has always been and always will be. And so this like one point in history where things were created and this one point in history where things will be destroyed and that's it for them. That's not how reality is. And so hmm. for them, it's this spiralic process that's not saying that that creation and destruction doesn't happen it's saying that it's a pattern that keeps happening and so for them um the idea of many different possible incarnations of god fits within that paradigm so within christianity um probably sounds like blasphemy to say that there's other incarnations of god that have graced the earth but within the Hindu perspective, within that paradigm, um, it makes sense to them. So for them, they don't see Christianity and Christ as something to be afraid of and be like, that's wrong. They kind of um, include him into their lineage of like humanity, I guess you could say. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's like, oh, great, another another God or another incarnation of God. Nice yeah. to meet him. Whereas, right, you yeah. know, like maybe some more of the Western uh, Christian tradition would be like, there's there's Christ and then there's nothing else. And right, and then okay, so then my conversation that I posted with James Cortides, uh, he, we were talking about the cultural synthesis work that uh, Father Sarah from Rose and some others have done particularly in Taoism, uh, this is probably the language that they would describe something similar to what you just said, is that what the others did pre-Christ, right, before Jesus walked around and, you know, crucifixion, resurrection, all of that. So mm -hmm. hundreds of years before he showed up, there was teachers on the other side of the world in the far, far east in China and in Japan that, that they, uh, what, what these, uh, what these authors were saying was that they intuited the Tao or they intuited the, the eternal logos of God or the word of God. Mm -hmm. And I mean, what we were going over is that you could see like, oh yeah, that's the Trinity. You know, like they're describing that 
that there's two points of duality, then the first point of transcendence from duality, the next shape is the triangle. Mm. And then we were beginning describing that and it was like, man, that functions just like how Christians talk about the function of the Trinity. And so what these, what these authors were, or teachers were realizing is like, you know what? Like there's, there's something to this. Like they, this is some spot on revelation that is in sync with what we're doing. Of course, not all of it, right? There's some variations or there's some differences. Sure. But mm-hmm. you know, at least can we eat the meat and spit out the bones, let's say. Mm-hmm. And I just, I look at that and there's like more of a, a sophistication to, to learning and to having conversation and, and understanding things. So I think there, I mean, Christianity is an Eastern religion first and yeah. then it moved West. So uh, as I'm beginning to learn this year, there's an Eastern approach that is at times more sophisticated. So they would see it as Jesus was the full expression of the eternal logos, right? Or the manifestation of God, as perhaps you said. Mm -hmm. And so I I suppose that would be maybe the beginning of a Christian language for saying, you know what, There's, there's times when God has taught us or we've intuited through his creation, like his, through his invisible attributes or the, the patterns of reality that were fully expressed in, in Christ. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, that's fascinating. Um, I was actually, I've been reading a book called The Universal Christ by Richard Rohr. And um, something that I found really interesting was he talked about creation being the first incarnation of Christ. Hmm. And yes. kind of that idea of the eternal logos. But um, for me, with my, I guess, journey into Hinduism and like the Shakta philosophy, that idea of the first incarnation of Christ being creation and these patterns of creation or this language of creation that happens, that's like, for me, um, I've been finding this inherent divinity within creation and like the more I study ecology and soil and this intricately woven web of relations that a lot of these um these teachings that we read in scriptures are patterned in the natural world and in creation and so it's just it's fascinating that even according to Richard Rohr within that Christian paradigm of seeing creation as the first incarnation of Christ like that fit that can fit within that worldview where before um, it could totally fit within uh, a Hindu paradigm, but I was not seeing how it could fit within the, I guess the Christian upbringing that I had, mm-hmm. which again, the, the Westernness of the church I grew up in probably doesn't necessarily help with that. Right. So I'd say a Western approach is like either or, Mm -hmm. And from what I can pick up, the Eastern Christian view would be more of like, well, there's a hierarchy of meaning, Mm -hmm. right? So it's like, yeah, those things are meaningful or there's things we can learn, but, you know, keep your priorities in line would be another way of saying it, where it's like, you can still have Christ as the center of all meaning or the the top of, of the most meaningful thing in your life and still be able to learn things and be able to pick up other things. But it's not like, what you're learning automatically goes to the top of your meaning hierarchy, you know, Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's a a little bit more of a nuance. Okay. So, so two things, first of all, what you're describing with Richard Rourke is, I don't know if you can see that properly. Yeah. Okay. So St. Athanasius, he wrote in the fourth century. And what's amazing is that what he was saying is that, uh, let me just pull up the quote here. if I can find it should have it like blasting and highlighter. There it is. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here we go. On page 26, it says, the renewal of creation has been wrought by the self-same word or logos who made it in the beginning. There is thus no inconsistency between creation and salvation, for the one father has employed the same agent for both works, affecting the salvation of the world through the same word who made it in the beginning. Mm. Mm-hmm. So like, yeah, Christ would, or the logos would be the, the agent of creation and he'd also be the agent of salvation. Mm-hmm. And when I read that, man, it was like two different domains of, of thought and, you know, it, uh, it, it's, how would I say it? Investigation just like came uh-huh. right together. 
Where it's like, oh yeah, create. Okay, now I'm beginning to understand why John wrote what he did in John one. You know, uh, he's the word of the uh, the logos from the beginning, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so again, this was like this was written in Alexandria and kind of like the Near Eastern world, and so they just saw Christ as like, okay, so the same pattern maker in creation, right? where we see in, you know, divine form or what's called sacred geometry, right? So like Mm -hmm. the golden ratio or, you know, how you look at the center, the top part of a a pine cone maybe, right? And you can just Mm -hmm. see that there's this divine pattern or cohesiveness to to the design of of that created thing. And we see this all over the place and throughout creation. And it's measurable with mathematics, which is amazing. Okay, Mm -hmm. so the same person that put all of those things into place and the patterns of our consciousness even, let's say, he showed up in incarnated form, you know, 2000 years ago and people could look at him. Mm-hmm. Right. So there's not a discrepancy between those two things. It's one and the same, same agent. And so it was like the highest also became the lowest, so to speak, or the, the highest point of heaven, right. The meaning maker took earthly form. And really, I mean, like even like socially, relationally, uh, culturally, all of that, he was the lowest of the lowest. Right. I mean, he he was in poverty, really. He was when he was tried, he was, you know, of lowest estate. He had no one with him, no possessions. He was the lowest of creation. So it was like kind of like this, this creating this axis from the top of heaven to the bottom of earth. And even then that says that he, he went all the way down into Hades. So it's like mm-hmm. saying like he went down to the depths of, of the human soul or the human consciousness even and raised it back up with renewal. So, okay, that's point number one. The second thing is I'm seeing something in your background of of the picture of your webcam. And I'm I'm just wondering like, what the heck is that? And maybe you could talk more about. Yeah. 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 So that back there is a poster of different soil microbes. Okay. And then that right there would be my microscope. Okay, so you're talking about soil ecology and seeing patterns, and and I thought you were just talking about you know a compost pile maybe, mm-hmm. you know, and and seeing that at that level, but you're actually like zooming into it, man. Like not the microcosmic level, but like the microscope cosmic level. Right, <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So yeah. I wonder what that process has been like, and some of the things you've been picking up on. Um, it's been fascinating because once I when I started studying soil ecology and learning how to use the microscope to identify organisms and learn about what they do. That's when I had stopped my meditation practice and I just had a lot of things internally come up that I needed to process that I was shoving to decide whether it was consciously or subconsciously. And so um, at that time, I stopped my normal spiritual practice that I had actually gotten to be pretty disciplined at and was just kind of completely confused about everything. I feel like my foundation for understanding the world was taken from me. Um, and so around that time, that's when I was also just like, you know, I got to go even more serious into the work that I'm doing because I do see this as my service. And at least it's, a practical use of my time while I'm so confused instead of like going on some downward spiral of addiction or whatnot. I just probably worked more than I I should have, (laughs) but learning. So shutting off that inward gaze of trying to find God within myself, I was learning about these mic, these microbes and looking at these microbes squiggle underneath the microscope that are in compost and in soil. (laughs) And as silly as it might sound, the um, again, it's like taking things that are unseen and bringing them to light really creates a more vivid and relational or vivid picture that you can have deeper relation with. And so for me, once it's like I was hearing about what these microbes do and how um, really crucial they are for the existence of the material world. So not just us, but everything else. Learning about that, then actually being able to see them was just a really powerful experience. And um, through that experience of learning of that intricate web 
of those relationships of like how crucial these silly, small, seemingly in, um, unimportant little microbes are and learning how interconnected and interdependent they are on our existence and the existence of trees and grass and the air we breathe and everything. God was manifesting in front of me. And so it's like this pattern through the bicycle trip of even if I wasn't quite sure who God was, God would God never left. God was always there. And so I shut the door because I was confused to the inside of me being like, I just need to take a break from this. And God was like, nope, I'm still here. <laughs> <laughs> and so it was this really beautiful yeah, process yeah. of like going microscopic in order to like literally try to see some of the smallest particles of material reality that we can with the, these tools in order to see God through material reality and be like, you don't have to reject or go beyond or renounce the material world in order to find me. Mm. I am here as well. Um, wow. Yeah. yeah. So I, I think that's another thing I've been learning too, is that historically, at least the near Eastern and Eastern Christians, they, it's, it's a different approach where they don't see it as like, we need to transcend corporal or, or, or physical realm that there's a harmony between heaven and earth. Right. And so they see that there's the possibility of the full redemption of the body, mm. right? Just like there's the full redemption of the earth at the end of the age or the redemption of the body through resurrection. So like there's, it's not like this is just like a ethereal, you know, maybe abstract, totally spiritual realm only. It's like, no, it's both. And it's like, mm -hmm. yes, there's the, the spiritual components of redemption, but then there's also the, the physical as well. And really like the other thing too, man, I learned there's a, a priest who wrote everywhere present understanding God in a one story universe. He calls it is because there's this, this paradigm that people have where they see God as the, the, the man upstairs right? And we use this language. And what it does is it creates this gap that's ever furthering right. from, you know, there's us here and our toil and our suffering and what we do. And we're trying to sort it all out and we don't get it. But then we can look up and somewhere up there out beyond is God. And what he's pointing out is like, actually, no, the, the Christian worldview is that he's in everything and everywhere present. Mm -hmm. right so then you can see god in people you can see god in microscopic creatures and soil right? <laughs> right and suddenly you can begin seeing the pattern of of god's nature and the 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 hand of his design in, in all things or what he mm -hmm. calls a one-story universe it's like no look around you one story right <laughs> he's not upstairs like we think he is he's yeah. here like it, the glory of god fills all of the earth so look around <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and that just that just seems like a such so much more of a a, a method or a, a mode of integrating things instead of separating things and i had this I actually had this moment um i was <laughs> i remember when we learned how to say whole wheat bread in spanish when we were on our trip mm. it was pa pan integral integral yes yeah and i'm um I'm just, I'm fast. I just, I love the word whole and wholeness and uh -huh. just like the different layers of it, of us being whole and like this, the, the manifestation of these whole systems throughout mm -hmm. reality mm -hmm. and just this, this pattern of wholeness. And I was thinking of, um, I never used to consider or think of wholeness with integration, but I was thinking about pan integral and I was like, well, Integral is what they're oh, saying yeah. whole is in Spanish. I was like, oh, integral or inter integration. I was like, holy <laughs> mackerel. <laughs> like, that's what I've been yeah, missing yeah. this whole time is integrating these things. <laughs> yeah. No, actually, that's one of the primary attributes of the Logos is the, the, the act of integration. So it's the fact mm -hmm. that you can have, you know, one word, right, that integrates all of the possible words or the Logi. Mm -hmm. Right. So you have infinite logi or infinite uh, perspectives or ways of doing things or saying things, inf infinite words. Right. But then 
what the logos does is it, it creates that integration of all things. So that way you can say, you know, there's a oneness, but then there's also a communion of multiplicity. Right. Right. Yeah. And my problem was I had a, um, an intellectual understanding of that, but I wasn't, it was for like someone else. And that experience wasn't the one that I was having or like that wasn't the mode that I was looking for of like that fully integrated being within the material world, which again, it's like my understanding of this spiralic relationship to teachings where the teaching, it was there the whole time, but our relationship or my relationship to it wasn't at a place to, to get that meaning out of it. Mm -hmm. So it's just, it's fun to see how just the, like the fractals of life happen and that meaning just kind of gets amplified to, to everything. Yes. And like you find it in one place and all of a sudden it's everywhere. <laughs> yes. Yeah, absolutely. You know how you can take uh, the pattern of the tree, right? But then all of a sudden you see that same principle or that same pattern repeated in, you know, the trunk and the branch and then maybe the, the uh, sub branches and then the twigs. And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, wow, that's like, I can see that pattern just multiplying at different scales and then understanding that that's how reality is too. That like, you know, this cosmic word that was used as an agent to create these patterns there. The, the really interesting thing I'm learning is that it's, it's all, it's not just in the material world. It's also at the human consciousness level too. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, you can see how maybe um, let's take the garden for example. So you were talking about weeding and it's like, okay, that is a perfect symbol of the human conscious or the human soul where we have, you know, the healthy plants, be it peace and love and virtues, faith, right? But then we have these, these uh, species of plants mm -hmm. that want to come and rob the nutrients from the life giving, you know, nutrient, nutrient producer plants they want these other ones, these invaders, they want to rob you of that. And so what those are called is, you know, maybe the passions or the lust or addictions, right? Mm -hmm. Or whatever those things may be. And, and so those things will actually rob life from you. And what Christianity would call like, you know, death or the, the agents of, of maybe demons in the spiritual realm. But you could definitely explain it, carrying out those patterns within the garden itself and then yeah. you read the book of Isaiah, the prophet, and he's like, no, you are a well-watered garden. So tend your garden. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And what I find even fascinating is like putting on a, um, a spatial dimension to that pattern is with ecological succession, um, instead of viewing things as weeds, it's this idea that um, life begets more life. Um, or this idea that like a plant presence, a weed, for instance, it's there because it's fulfilling a, a specific niche. Mm -hmm. And we might try to put a plant into that ecosystem that doesn't actually belong there. That ecosystem's not ready for it yet. Mm -hmm. But those bad plants are actually the earth's way of cultivating the environment for that more desirable plant to be. Okay. Yeah. So I, I can feel see like that. it's almost, we can even twist on what we think of as seemingly bad mm -hmm. as they're um, enriching our environment in order for us to be in a more life giving place. So instead of seeing it as like stripping our life, they're giving us the opportunity to enrich it and actually give more, which mm -hmm. is kind of just like a, a switch of perspective. Yeah, no, I, I can see that within the, the Christian walk at, at least is there's like a flipping that happens where what uh let's see what the verse says is what was meant for evil god flipped or he turned for good so there's like i was just thinking like we're in a very windy place mm. in california here and usually that causes a lot of chaos where like th stuff gets blown around and you know we end up like being really upset or even cursing it at times but then there was like this flip happened right and it's like oh man like someone gave us a kite Right. Like, right. 
This yeah. is like the best place ever to fly kites. And so now my daughter's like, couldn't be more thrilled, right? <laughs> Going out and it's like, kite, kite every day. Right. She wants to fly kites. I'm like, That's just awesome. wait for the afternoon winds. I know it's coming. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I want to say that um, the garden is interesting because like how we mentioned very early on in our conversation that you started reading the language of creation by Matthew Peugeot. Mm, mm -hmm. And what really stood out to me is he says that there's an, an ancient worldview or uh, a cosmology, a way of understanding how the, the functionings of the, you know, physical and the metaphysical within our universe. And he calls it dentrocentric or tree centric, or mm -hmm. you could expand that to garden centric, right? Where you can explain the patterns of creation in all of its different manifestations, right? You can explain it through the garden. And mm -hmm. I just, I wonder like, so about where are you at in the book and what do you think so far? Um, I think I'm like 60 or so pages into the book. And, and kind of in regards to what you just said, that's one of the things that, the reasons why I've always been, always appreciated gardening and farming because I am, um, I do like philosophy a lot and metaphors and symbols and all of that. And for me, farming, it was just like, well, this is the source of a lot of those. And it's not just a metaphor. Like this is what it actually is as well. Mm. So there's that yes. layered meaning to it that I've always really appreciated about it. Cause again, just that the embodiedness of it is just so present there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And he makes that claim. Peugeot says, he's like, symbols are not metaphors. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I always thought that was one of the more bold claims of the book. And he's, he goes on to explain, it's like, no, they're just hosting. They're, they're like an earthly vessel that's hosting a heavenly pattern. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's like, you can see these patterns, you know, in the microcosmic level. Um, and then all the way to the, the macrocosmic, you know, mm -hmm. so we could see it in the individual, like in our lives as being a garden and carrying out a lot of these patterns that we just talked about, but then also at the communal level where like a community is a garden too. And then of course the Genesis accounts, they're saying, no, the whole cosmos is like a garden, uh -huh. right? And all these patterns. So it's like you can, something that you can denote from it being distinctly symbolic is that it's, it stretches out and there's a scalability to the lessons that you're learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So yeah. 60 pages in you're, you've gone through the introduction of like the science, modern scientific worldview versus more of like the ancient cosmological worldview. And you've gone through part one, maybe part two of heaven and earth. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And so what do you think so far? Are there some confusions or some like really like awesome points of revelations? Um, I don't know if I'd say there's been awesome points of revelations as of yet. Um, I have appreciated just trying to understand the worldview that he's trying to describe. And I have had to reread things over and over again. Um, yes. Just because I feel like, at least for me and the way my mind works, some of the examples that he have that he gives aren't as intuitive as they would be for like, the way my mind processes things. So I'd have to just like reread and reread and trying to say, all right, he's trying to kind of say this simply, but I'm not quite getting the correlation yet. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but no, it's been interesting. One of the things that I, I kind of struggle with and then I'm trying to give it time and um, understanding that there's probably like, a successional process that the book's going through. So I'm curious how it's going to come around. Um, because for me, like modern science brings me deeper into my spirituality and I don't see them as binaries that mm. are opposing each other. Mm -hmm. And so um, just like my way of relating to the world and reality, that's not the experience that I have. Um, so like, sometimes having it described as like the strictly materialistic and strictly spiritual worldview for me, I'm just like, they're the same thing. <laughs> right. Yes. Well, I'll, I'll give you a hint that where the book begins 
is it's where it ends as well. Okay. And so it, the structure of the book kind of follows this like cyclical pattern. And so it's, so maybe it's like, if you start here, you talk about science and, and the modern materialistic worldview. And I mean, probably like he's, he's referring to its extremes, right. And maybe like a Richard Dawkins, let's say, or Hawking's. And then, so what happens is like, it goes really far away from that and really leans way over to describe this ancient worldview that, you know, maybe it's on the, the verge of extinction if we let it go, but it's really important because it can bring a lot of insight into how to see and, and how to be in the world. Mm-hmm. But then it comes back and it talks about the harmony of those worldviews and showing how they actually work together. Okay, cool. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, that's another thing too, man. It's like when I grew up, it was like, you know, religion versus science, right? And it was like, mm-hmm. you know, creation versus evolution. And it was very binary yeah and what i've seen is like you know what actually the especially the the foundations and the modern scientific movements were actually initiated by christians Mm. right like i was just reading and and writing about one in uh let's see see this is a fairly recent example but it was uh it was a priest in russia and what happened was, is that there was a, the Bolshevik revolution and there was just like pretty crazy, like what uh, the communist Soviet Union did to the, the Christians and the religious groups in Asia. But what happened was, is that even under persecution, he still served as an electrical engineer to help electrify Russia. Huh. Yeah. yeah. So let's, let's see, let me pull up. Okay. So um, I found it in uh, a story of Christianity by David Bentley Hart. And he's pretty well respected uh, philosopher. And okay. So it's Pavel Florensky is the name of the priest. And he came out with uh, what's called his magnum opus, the pillar and ground of truth, which talks about the Christian metaphysics of love. And it says that, so Florensky served Oh, let me just back up. So as it was, the new government had need of his services in the grand project of the electrification of Russia. Florensky served, but refused to abandon the traditional cassock, uncropped hair and beard of an Orthodox priest. And then in 1933, he was sentenced to 10 years hard labor in a gulag or a prison camp and then killed in 1937 during the the great purge, as it's called. So it's like, like one heck of a story. And I just thought it was interesting that here he has, you know, just these really well-respected works about, you know, the metaphysics of love, but he was one of the most uh, in demand uh, electrical engineers of his country. And so I just thought it was a great example of what we're talking about, where he's like, he had the spiritual and like maybe like the practical vocation Mm -hmm. in line. And it was like this really good idea of like, he also wrote some very important pieces on um, in the scientific world. And he had a scientific journal that he started and other authors. It was like one of the most respected scientific journals. So it was like in his world, it wasn't an either or it was like, no God's in creation. And it's my, uh, my honor as a steward to be able to draw out those patterns and to understand it in a way that marries or unifies heaven and earth. Right. to improve the garden let's say and so yeah i just i thought that him being you know also at the same time you know you see this picture of all of these other engineers trying to figure out how to electrify russia maybe in like lab coats or whatever and then uh-huh. he's in this like black robe you know this cassock <laughs> with all of his priestly vestments and he wouldn't you know it's, it's his yeah, way awesome. of, of keeping his priorities i guess Mm-hmm. Even if it, you know, ultimately led to his death. I know that he was wrongfully tried. And one of the grounds that they said is because he mentioned the kingdom of heaven in, in one of his scientific entries. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right, Steve. Well, yeah, my encouragement is to approach language of creation like you did Spanish or Arabic or even French. Uh-huh. Because I approached it as like an academic book. And struggled i was frustrated because i kept having to slow down like you said and like reread and reread and i was like you know what 
I didn't approach Spanish like this. And after all, the title says language of creation. And once I began mm-hmm. approaching it like a language, I mean, he's, he's also doing a very big thing of trying to describe a completely foreign worldview to many of us Westerners, especially. And he's even like reappropriating certain terminology. So like the way that we describe time and space, for example, which is the second part of the book and the second, you know, pair of the cosmology is that we don't even use them the same way that the ancients did Mm. or understood them. So time would be like cyclical change, right? So the seasons, let's say, and then transformative change as well. Mm. And then Mm -hmm. space would be not like this vacuum out in the atmosphere. It's actually like the built environment. So it's the, the thing that we do, like how we build fencing and beds and structure in a garden because it's, it's um, trying to maybe like fight back the transformative elements of, of time. Okay. Yeah. So like, for example, like we wall a garden, right? And in walling a garden, it's saying like, there's an outside and inside. I know there's like a couple of different ways of approaching this. Say like, like a food forest would be like, you want to incorporate more of the forest in mm-hmm. rather than, you know, maybe just making it. Uh, I think a good way of describing is like there's a balance, right? So there's eternal cosmic tug of war between these forces of the cosmos where there's like a wall, but there's a balance of like, okay, so how much order, right? Are we going to use tractors? Are we going to use furrows? Are we going to, you know, do monocrop, right? So then there's perhaps that's like leaning way too far on the overstructure, the over, the mm, leaning mm. too far in a, a overly ordered yeah, space. Yeah. But then there's this other movement. It's like, no, we need more of the, maybe like the, the untouched chaos of the forest to be inside of our garden. And so then it's more of those like cyclical change and transformative, which is appropriating more of time. Does yeah, that make yeah. sense? Oh yeah, totally. And actually it makes me think of, um, like in the permaculture world, they talk a lot about edges being the most abundant ecosystem. And, huh. um, and there's this, this idea too, I've been studying um, some within something called holistic management and it draws a lot from a philosophy called holism and just this idea that nature functions within holes and patterns and that there actually aren't any nature, any, any boundaries in nature hmm. and that it's just holes within holes in a variety of patterns. And so when we try to actually like find this, hard boundary it doesn't exist Mm -hmm. and um and so and they talk about this idea that instead of seeing boundaries as these places that separate and isolate but they're actually these places that delineate different systems and they're places of connection and interaction and relationship and so it's like it's fascinating to kind of hear that description and also like pattern that's actually happening in, in creation mm-hmm. of that dynamic balance between different systems and things that seem like there's like fixed boundaries, but really mm-hmm. they're not there. Yeah. So another way of describing it would be like dry land would be like the ordered world and mm-hmm. then the chaos of the, the primordial waters of the ocean. And then, so like at the margins, there would be like the sand of the seashore. Mm-hmm. Right. So it's not quite land because, you know, it's kind of crumbly. You can't build upon it necessarily. Right. But it's not quite the sea, but it's kind of like this marginal space or liminal space. And so he talks about that in the book, but then he also uses like perhaps like a tapestry mm-hmm. as an example, where like, you know, the center of the tapestry is carrying out the familiar pattern. And then of order, right? And then there's these fringes on the outside, right? And then the fringes, that's like the margins, like between what's not the blanket and what is the blanket. But it's also in this marginal space, it's also where we appropriate foreign things into the familiar. Mm. Kind of like what you're describing where it's not like hard lines. There's these kind of like overlaps and overlays and and to where you have like a, these fringes where it's actually where say like new things can be learned. Does that make sense? Or it can be brought into the garden. 
Mm-hmm. Right. So we think of this as like, oh man, this was this crazy foreign plant called a dandelion, right? <laughs> and it grows everywhere and, you know, it's amongst the forest and, and now it's like trying to make its way in. The margin would be that which says, okay, at what point do we say, no, you're not exactly foreign. We just don't understand you yet. But then there's this incorporation process to where it does become part of the garden in a productive way once we understand it as such. Mm-hmm. And that's the place where that would take place. Mm-hmm. So I think it's just so interesting that, that within permaculture, like the, the edges would be the most productive because like if you were to take this story, for example, okay, so one thing that he does is he does this in text and story form where in the main part of his chapters, he takes the facts and the events of the story that are familiar, right? That are verifiable. You know, it's like more of like the academic approach, but then he has like these vignettes that are even set in different font and, you know, not black, but gray. And they're kind of like the legendary, the myth, yeah, the, maybe the controversial stuff. And so all those things that are usually marginalized by a community, right? But he makes a place for it because he understands that that's the pattern of creation and it needs to be there because what it does is it opens it up to the vast potentiality, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. So, which is chaotic to us because we don't understand it. Like we don't know how deep the well is, right? We don't know how, how vast love is, let's say. And so he has figures like there's one uh, that comes to mind Saint Seraph or Saint Seraphim of Seraph, who's also during that same uh, time period in Russia. And he was so harmonized with nature, right, and God's created world that people would view him uh, feeding bears and the beasts of the forest from his palm. Uh huh. Right? Which is like, how is that even possible, right? So it confuses us. It's, you know, marginalized, it's legendary, it's a myth. But yet it opens us up to this whole area of like, well, what's possible? Mm. I don't know. That could be possible. Do we know what the limit is, what the border is of possibility? Right? Maybe it's bigger or deeper than we ever realized. Right. Yeah. Does it make sense? (laughs) Yeah. No, I think it does make sense. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, Steve, I I think we should uh, begin just making our descent of this conversation. Um, (laughs) I'm just wondering if there's any uh, anything you wanted to leave the viewers with as far as maybe encouragements with spiritual practice or maybe further reading in that realm or maybe even with gardening, you know, further resources to check out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, like my, my draw to gardening is partly because it's my way of mending that relationship with the natural world that I think we're intimately woven into whether we like it or not. And so, <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I, um, I invite everyone to see gardening or at least try seeing gardening through that lens a little bit to see how, um, it can invite us back into that interwoven web of creation. Um, and so that way it's not just growing a couple of zucchinis for us to, to eat with our family, but it's also, reestablishing that connection that we are created with from the very beginning. Um, and on a practical sense, <laughs> um, I would recommend looking into, um, there's a lot of different resources for permaculture and the style of farming that I was talking about. Some people call it no-till or no-dig. It goes by the term no-dig over in Europe a lot. Um, there's a guy named Charles Dowding, Dow, I think Dowding is his last name, I can get you the spelling for that, who has a lot of videos on YouTube and is, so ever since I think like the 80s, has been teaching people how to garden but do it without tillage to grow more nutrient-dense food. Um, and so I would recommend looking into him. Um, And I think one of the, the, I've got a lot of teachers that I could share names of, but my biggest teacher I feel like is nature or God through nature. 
And so I highly recommend just being in nature and observing. And with this understanding that nature functions within patterns, that we have the opportunity to observe those patterns and relate them to our lives. And so I find a lot of inspiration and insight by being in the woods or in a stream and how that can actually impact how I'm um, interacting with my community or my, my partner. And there's, I find a lot of inspiration there. And so I don't have uh, like steps of what you do when you're outside, but I think just being there is a, is a good start. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. I really appreciate that you, uh, you joined me in conversation today. I, I always love talking with you, but this, this has been a special one. Yeah, no, I'm happy that you invited me onto the conversation. I was happy to see that you're doing the YouTube channel. Even when we were traveling, you were um, big into writing and I always appreciated that about you. So it was nice to see the next succession of that come through YouTube and creating videos. Yeah, I remember fondly that Chad was always the photographer and the, you know, happy go lucky one. And uh -huh. Steve was like the, the spiritual farmer. And I was more of like the <laughs> creative, you know, writer and speaker right. or something like that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's been really cool to see how those uh, traits have unfolded since, since our journeys together on bike. Mm -hmm. All right, Steve. Well, uh, yeah. So how about some further resources? Um, Facebook pages, websites. Yeah. Um, if you want, I can send over a list of materials if that could be helpful mm -hmm. um, to share with people. How about um, with uh, Living City Farms? Oh, yeah. I'm always trying to not focus on myself. So there's that too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, good so, luck with the interview thing, you know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Here I am so, trying um, to draw it out of you. You're like, no, no, no. No, no, no. <laughs> yeah. So um, we have, we don't have a website yet, but we have an Instagram page and a Facebook page. So if you look up Living City Farms, the handle on Instagram is living.city.farms. And um, it, I think it's the same for Facebook. That's at least Living City Farms. And so you can stay up to date with what we're up to. We'll be trying to share more of what we're doing and have more. I have the intention of having kind of more educational things through what we're our farming process of starting up a new farm and the way that we're growing, but also weaving in the human element and that spiritual element of, of the context of how it's all happening. So mm -hmm. I don't know exactly how it's going to unfold, but I'm exciting, excited that we're, we're starting that process. I'd also encourage the viewers to, to check out your Facebook page, you know, Steve Larson, because I, I just find it to be a really great, resource where it's a lot of the things that we've talked about. It's not like you just post stuff about farming or microscopes. Right? Yeah. But you also incorporate a lot of like the deeper thought into it or, or spiritual journey as well. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I'd recommend that. I tried to post things that inspire me and not get into all the things that are polar polarizing the world. Um, and another, a book that I've um, found very insightful, for kind of like the pattern on the, the cultural size of things or scale of things. There's a book called Designing Regenerative Cultures by a guy named Daniel Christian Wall. Um, and it's been a really helpful book for me of kind of seeing how I, my views of how um, creation and how things are functioning and how I'm trying to have that manifest through the farming that I'm doing. He's kind of taking those lessons and posing questions, not so many, not so, so much as posing solutions, but posing questions to ask in order to find deeper ways to um, live into those realities collectively that are kind of like mimicking or invoking those patterns that are happening in nature and creation. So I, Recommend looking into that book too. Awesome, thank you. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe we'll uh, we'll just pause this conversation and pick up in a, a month or two, maybe, and uh, perhaps after you finish the language of creation book. Yeah, that sounds good to me. We can just dive right into the topic at hand. It's been a, a real joy to to walk through your story today and and hear what you care about a lot too. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Until it. next time. 
Iya. 